We're out here on Hillsborough Street looking for real answers to some real questions. I believe a secret to a successful life is doing whatever fulfills your potential, doing what makes you happy. Finding whatever makes you happy and uh, doing that as much as you can. Um, yeah, I think determination would probably be the secret. Yeah. Just never giving up. I believe the secret to a successful life is helping others. Uh, time management, right? Making the most of the a lot of time you're given. For me, knowing that my kids are good people. Oh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our Savior. But it's whatever makes you happy, whatever. If success in life is family, then it's having a good family. It's finding that one goal that you try to achieve. Hard work and patience. You're never going to get anything if you sit on your ass and you don't do anything. But at the same time, things don't always go your way. So you need to be patient and realize that sometimes it'll be harder than others. And you just got to wait it out and keep working hard because things will get better. A positive outlook on life. <laughs> um, I'm good. Hey, hey, uh, what, hey, come on. Why are you running? What's the, what's the secret to success? My name is uh, Chase Gardner. I'm the pastor of adult learning here at Hope Community Church, and I am super excited. We are kicking off a brand new five-week series called Big Questions, Honest Answers. And what we're going to be doing over the next five weeks is, you guessed it, give some honest questions to some big, uh, no, honest, that's, yeah, that would be bad, honest answers to some big questions. We're going to be doing this through the book of the Psalms. Uh, so I love the book of Psalms because, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's the most human and the most approachable of all the Bible books. And I guarantee that no matter where you are this weekend, you're going to be able to identify with uh, not just one, but probably 20 or 30 or 40 of the Psalms. And what we're going to be finding here uh, over the next five weeks is that the big questions that we all have are in no way new or peculiar to the 21st century. Uh, people of all walks of life, of all ages, have always struggled with these questions. And it's going to be really cool because we're going to get to go to the Psalms and see real people uh, with real faults and real emotions struggling with these questions and oftentimes providing us with answers. So if you have your Bible, uh, we're going to be in Psalms 1 this weekend. And I love Psalms when you go ahead and turn there. I love Psalm 1 because it's going to um, set up the other 149 Psalms that we're going to be going through the next four weeks. I'm just kidding. We're not going to go through 149 Psalms. We're just going to hit five. Uh, but go ahead and turn there. But, um, so let's talk a little bit about our question. How do I find success in life? What is the secret to success in life? And I think uh, if you just watch that video, you can tell that every single person in this room tonight probably has a different definition of what success is. Uh, we would all have, we would all define success differently. And because of that, we all view uh, that there's different roads to get to success. And as if that is not complicated enough, uh, our ideas of success kind of change over the course of our lifetime, do they not? Uh, and I think that as I look back, you know, we all have these idols or these uh, heroes in our life that kind of embody success. Uh, so I look back over my life and my earliest memory, my earliest hero growing up was Donatello. Um, not the artist, but the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Um, and that dude was awesome. Yes, he wore purple, but he rocked it. Um, and he didn't have fancy nunchucks, just used a stick of wood to hurt those bad guys. Uh, he was a teenager, which was awesome. Uh, he was a mutant turtle, so you can't beat that. And he was a ninja. So that's, that's all three that I need in my book. So it was Donatello. And then as I, I grew up, I started playing guitar and getting into bands in like sixth grade and seventh grade and eighth grade. So my idols and my heroes changed, right? The rock stars, the, the Eddie Vedders and Tom Yorker Radiohead. Those guys were success to me. Uh, and then as I uh, got married and uh, got into ministry, thankfully my heroes changed. And uh, they changed to the famous pastors, right? John Piper, Jonathan Edwards, the Billy Grahams, those guys that kind of took the world by storm and taught the word of God and changed the world. And so uh, those were my, my idols, my heroes for so long. And now that I have kids, I got a three-year-old and a four-year-old, and we're adopting. Yes, it's taken a long time for us to adopt, but we're kind of near in the home stretch. Uh, but I got a three- and four-year-old at home, so I'm kind of tired a lot of times. So I think my hero has switched kind of a mix between uh, Billy Graham and Garfield, the cat. Um, it's like a Christian Garfield, right? So you wake up and read the Bible, but then he's like, say something funny and eat some lasagna, and that is a good day to me. That's a good Saturday. So um, our definitions of success change over time. And if you're a lady, uh, hopefully you're a lot different than me. Hopefully Donatello was not your hero. Uh, but I'm guessing if you're in middle school or high school, 
Uh, maybe your definition of success was how you looked or what clothes you wore, what boyfriend you had. And then as you went into college and, and got married and started your career, maybe it changed to how far along uh, on the career path you were, the pursuit of the American dream or your husband. And then if you have kids, right off the bat, your definition of success changes. So we all have different definitions that change over time. But even though that's the case, uh, we can't escape the fact that we all uh, deeply struggle to answer this question. We all find a need inside of our hearts to, uh, to answer the question, uh, what is success and how do I get there? I think, I think we've all had those moments where we lay in bed at night right before we go to sleep and we kind of look back over all our years on this, on this planet and, and all the people we've known and all the choices we've made and kind of think it could have turned out so much differently, right? You ever have those what if questions? What if I would have uh, gone to a different college or gone to college or chosen a different major? Uh, what if I would have my, met my spouse earlier or met them later? Uh, what if I would have had more kids or a smaller number of kids? Or what if I would have taken that job offer a few years back? Or uh, what if I s just quit tomorrow and completely start anew? Would I be wealthier? Would I be happier? Would I be successful? And I think at some point we just give up on these questions because life's complicated, right? There seems to be limitless options, limitless definitions of success, and limitless roads to get towards success. I mean, uh, some people work years and years and years to get to success, and they never find it. And then one guy, he might wake up in the morning, and there's a bear jumping on his trampoline, and he takes a video of it and posts it to YouTube, instant success, right? Right? And so even the, even the dictionary is confused. There's two definitions to success in the dictionary. One goes, uh, the accomplishment of an aim or purpose. And the second one is the attainment of popularity or profit. Okay, so even the dictionary is confused when it comes to this thing that we call success. So no matter where you are this weekend, the Bible is going to have a lot to say to each of us. So um, whether you're, you just came for the first time in a few years back to church, whether you're uh, kicking the tires of Christianity, kind of checking this whole religion thing out, or whether you've been a Christ follower for, for many, many years, I'm going to ask you to do two things. Really, really lean in and pay attention and just spend the next 30 to 40 minutes listening to God's word and ask yourself these two questions. Could it be that your definition of success is wrong? Is that even a possibility? Could it be that your definition of success is wrong? And secondly, could it be that the definition that God's word gives us of success and the advice that it tells us on how to get there, could it be that that, that opinion is correct and real and true? Just ask yourself, those two things, because Psalms 1 is really going to help us. Now, first off, it's going to point us down the road towards success, and then later on in the psalm, it's really going to define what success is. And the Bible, we're going to see, has this amazing way of simplifying and clarifying this thing that we call life. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it up. We're going to be in Psalms 1, and we're going to start in verse 1. It's only six verses, so we'll read it all the way through. And uh, I do warn you, there's going to be some language we're not used to, um, no cuss words or anything, but there's just going to be some language and some nouns that we don't use, and, and I'll talk about that in a second. So verse 1. Blessed, right, happy, successful, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. And therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And so right off the bat, the Bible just simplifies everything, doesn't it? The Bible says there are not limitless definitions of success, and there's not limitless ways of achieving success. How many roads are there according to the Psalms? There's just two. There's one that leads to failure, and there's one that leads to success. There's one that leads to something worse than failure, and a road that leads to something way better than success. Now, um, the Bible does use these words, wicked and sinners and mockers, and they're kind of um, harsh words. So maybe you're, you came for the first time in years, and uh, you left the church because you got burned by some judgmental Christians, and you're thinking in your head, oh no, here we go again, talking about the heathens and judging the sinners, right? So let me just uh, clarify a few things. First off, the Bible is very clear that every single person that has ever lived and will ever lived is a sinner. We have missed the mark. That's what sin means. And so every person in this room this weekend has to fully admit, including me, that I was a sinner and am currently a sinner. 
I have these desires to rebel against God, and I can't live up to the life that he's called us to. But, but a change has taken place in those that call themselves Christ followers. Uh, through a miracle of God, not by their works, not by their, by their obedience, not by their worth, the Holy Spirit has come to the Christ follower and regenerated them, is what the Bible calls, and woken them up. And the, the Holy Spirit has allowed us to see that we are on the wrong road. And so the Holy Spirit comes to us and wakes us up. You're on the wrong road, but there's a way to get on the right road, and it's through Jesus Christ. He lived the life you couldn't live and died the death that you should have died. And when you put your faith in him, you can be set down on this right road. And that's happened to those of us who call ourselves Christ followers. And now, humbly, out of need and desperation, we're seeking to obey God and to listen to his word. And so the difference between a Christ follower and a non-Christian is not that one sins and one doesn't. It's that they both sin, but the Christian hates their sin because of the effect it has on their relationship with God and their relationship with others. So this psalm is not a big, hooray, I'm a Christian, I'm righteous, and all these other dumb people are on the wrong road. I get to look down on them and judge them. It's not that. It's, it's this sober warning. It's but for the grace and the mercy and the miracle of God, I would be on the wrong road, and I need all the help and the wisdom and the advice that I possibly can get, Okay. So the psalmist isn't just throwing out these words that he won't apply to himself as well. So let's move on. In life, there are two paths. There's the way of the righteous that leads to success, actually much more than success, and the way of the wicked that leads to failure, actually much more than failure. And so we have to ask ourselves, what separates those two roads? What separates the person on the right path from the person on the wrong path? Now, if I was writing this psalm, it would be a quick psalm. It would say, blessed is he who does not walk in the way of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but he's a dude that's not wicked and doesn't sin and doesn't scoff. That's not what the psalmist here says. The psalmist doesn't say, you want to be on the right road? Well, then stop being wicked. Don't sin, don't scoff, and you'll be there. That's not what he says. Listen to what he says. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of sinners. Of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. See, the psalmist says the difference between the two roads is that the person on the wrong road is being influenced by the world, and the person on the right road is seeking to be influenced by God's word and God's truth. It's all a matter of influence. And see, the the author starts this way because um, he knows himself. Okay? He doesn't think that highly about himself. He knows that, that willpower is simply not enough when it comes to success in life. He knows that simple uh, discipline and obedience is not enough. He doesn't think that highly about himself. He knows that uh, given the opportunity, 99% of the time, he will and all of us will make a dumb decision, right? Um, husbands, have you ever tried to order dinner for your wives? How'd that turn out for you? Not too good? I tried it three times and it was horrible. So, Okay, that did not work on Saturday night. I will work that on Sunday. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But he knows uh, that 99% of the time he's going to make the wrong decision. And so um, that's why he says the difference between the person on the right road and the wrong road is that the person on the right path is seeking to be influenced by the word of God and uh, the person on the wrong road is being influenced by the world. And, And here's the truth. Here's what he's getting at. You see, when we're saved and the Holy Spirit wakes us up, and uh, gives us uh, new affections and new desires and new emotions and a new heart and sets us on the right path, Um, what happens is uh, we are saved and we are on the right path, but we're not automatically super Christians, are we? Maybe some of you have experience with that. When you get saved, you're not automatically a super Christian. The Bible actually calls us uh, babies, calls us infants. Paul says that you are spiritual infants. You need milk. Sometime you're going to mature and grow and be formed in the likeness of Christ, but right now you're a baby, and the only thing that has the power to shape us and to form us and grow us is the truths of the Word of God. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 12, 1 and 2, um, and this is the uh, Phillips translation. 
Uh, but Romans 12, so Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, Paul has been exploring this amazing thing that we call salvation. We're all in sin. Jesus Christ came and saved us, and now we have the Holy Spirit, and we can live and walk by the Spirit. And then chapter 11, he breaks out into worship. Oh, the depths and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And now Paul turns his attention to how do we respond to this gospel? How do we respond to this truth? And listen to the very first thing the Apostle Paul says. Romans 12, 1 and 2, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Now listen, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and move toward the goal of true maturity. Now see, the Bible says when we're saved, we're babies. We're shapeless. We're formless. And listen to this. Whether you like it or not, you will be shaped and formed by something. You will be influenced by something. And we should choose to be influenced by the word of God. The Bible's meant to reshape us into the likeness of Christ. When we spend time with it, when we meditate on it day and night, when we rehearse it, and when we, when we uh, quote it, when we do this, it makes a powerful impression on our lives and actually determines the direction of our very life. So um, there's two roads in life. There's one that leads to failure, one that leads to success. And the difference is that the person on the right road is influenced by the word of God. But the author is a very weird author, and he says something different here too. See, he doesn't just say that the difference between the person on the right road and the wrong road is that one person reads their Bible and the other doesn't. He doesn't use the word read there, does he? What word does he use? It's the term delight. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. And I love this term delight. If I were to characterize the Christian life by one word, it would be that term, delight. And maybe you're here uh, because your neighbor has been nagging you and nagging you and nagging you to come for six months and you finally showed up and you feel a bit awkward because you feel like a project. Like if you convert, maybe you don't have to tie up for three or four months or you're not sure what's going on. Uh, but that's not the reason your neighbor brought you. The reason is because he's found this amazing delight and joy in the word of God. He's, he's begun to submit himself to the Bible and obey it and he's found this amazing thing happen that his marriage is actually better because of it. It's not the best marriage in the world, but it's better than it was. And, and he's a better father. He's a better coworker. He's found delight and joy, and he wants to share that delight with you. And I love that the author uses this word. Um, it's so crucial when we speak about the Christian life because um, I've had lots of friends over the years who would call themselves Christ followers. Um, and at some point in their life, they chose to just walk away. Um, they no longer consider themselves Christ followers anymore. They don't consider themselves religious. And that didn't just happen overnight, okay? N that never just happens overnight. It's always a process. Uh, in James 1, 13 through 15, uh, James says, When one is tempted, no one should say that God is tempting you. For he cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But we are tempted when, by our own evil desires, we're dragged away and enticed. And once desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and once sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. So there's a desire, then an acting on that desire, which is sin, and then a continuation of that action, and it leads to death. It's a subtle but powerful process. That's the power of sin, okay? It doesn't just happen overnight. This is not an accident. You don't, no one wakes up in the morning and says, this morning I'm going to go eat some Bojangles biscuits and then sit in the seat of some scoffers, right? No one does that. No one accidentally walks away from God. No one accidentally commits adultery, right? Like, you're not my wife. No, no, that never happens, okay? It's never an accident. It's always this slow process. It's a, it's a walking and then a standing and then a sitting. It's, it's you start enjoying the stories of uh, the single guy at work. No wife, no kids. Brings a different girl home every night. Kind of crazy party stories. And at first, those stories kind of annoyed you. But then you listened and you listened, and you listened intently, and your desire started to work up, and slowly you start to th dream of this world where you're, you're free from a responsibility to your wife or to your kids, and, and free from the tyrannical rule of God where you can kind of pursue your own desires, and that desire works up and works up, and then you act, and then a month, a year, two years go down the road, and you don't have a wife, and you don't have kids, and your family's wrecked. 
Or at first, when you saw that your coworkers were kind of taking money from the company secretly and, and using it for themselves, you were shocked, but then you saw the cool stuff they bought, and you wanted some of that too, and your desire was conceived, right? And a month goes by, a year goes by, and you're just like them. Or maybe at some point in your life, you become okay with a little racy TV after dinner, right? A little two and a half men after dinner. And then after that, you start to stay up a little later to watch some really racy stuff. And then you start to get on sites that you know you should not be, and you spend more time and more time, and a week goes by, and a year goes by, and you're addicted. And a year or two ago, you would have never believed you could have gotten to this point. Sin is a slow and subtle process. It's a watching the world and watching it intently and slowly delighting in it, and then you walk away. It's a walking, a standing, a sitting. But sin doesn't show you the pain, does it? It doesn't show you the broken relationships that stem from that. And that's why we have to learn to delight in the word of God. As my favorite, uh, Pastor John Piper, he says, uh, the only hope against the pleasures of the world are the pleasures of the word of God. And we form the delight in the word of God the exact same way we form delight in the world, by reading it and watching it and reading it more, and reading it intently, and meditating on it until all the promises and the benefits start to delight us. And then the Bible has captured our hearts so that the world won't. And the psalmist is going to list a lot of these benefits here. But notice, as we read in verse 3, he doesn't just say, there are two roads in life, one that leads to failure and one that leads to success. And the difference is that one person delights in the word of God and the other person is influenced and delights in the world and by the world. And so if you're on the right road, then what happens? What are the benefits? You get to go to heaven. You're a good person. You'll stop sinning. That's not what he says. He lists these amazing benefits because he knows that the Christian life is so much more than just not sinning. Look at the picture uh, that, that verse 3 gives us. The person on the right path, he is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. And it's kind of a short analogy here, but it's so powerful. He's saying um, there's a river, right? And this is the life of God uh, that flows through the word of God. And by God's sovereign miracle, you're placed by this river And your roots reach this river. And uh, even though the rain stops falling and the sun gets hot and all the other trees are kind of withering and dying, you're staying strong. Your leaves are green during the drought and you're fruitful when others are barren. Uh, The psalmist is saying this is not read your Bible for helpful life advice. He's not saying read your Bible for behavior modification. He's saying tap into the power of God and be utterly transformed from the inside out. Lasting, fruitful durable. And this is when we begin to get a um, a definition of what true success is. The psalmist gives us three characteristics of what success is. Number one, he's like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. You're fruitful. And Paul, in one of his epistles, uh, latches on to this, this word fruitful, and he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, What the psalmist is saying is the person who delights in the word of God bears love in his marriage relationship and with his kids and with his coworkers. This person bears joy when times are tough, uh, bears peace in the midst of trial, patience in the midst of frustration, kindness in the midst of strife, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And not only is this person fruitful, but this person is durable and whose leaf does not wither. What the psalmist is saying is when the rains stop falling and the air gets hot and the sun is beating down on this this tree, these forests, and every other tree that's planted away from this river is withering and dying, this person stands strong. Their happiness and their joy is deep and it's durable because their joy is not based on circumstantial things, whether the rain is falling or which way the winds are blowing or if the money's coming in or if their job is going well, but their joy and happiness is based on an unchangeable source, the word and the promises of God. So this person is fruitful, this person is durable, and thirdly, he's prosperous. Whatever he does prospers. Now, we have to stop here, don't we? This is where the psalmist is going to really give us a definition of what true success is. We have to ask ourselves, is this true? If I read my Bible, will my bank account fill up? And I'll never get in a car wreck? 
and my kids will get full ride scholarships and everything I do will prosper? Not really. And there's lots of verses in the Bible that point out that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. That there's going to be plenty of times in life when the unrighteous look like they're being successful and prospering while the righteous look like they're um, failing and suffering. So what does this psalm mean? And it's cool what he writes in the last few verses. How do you measure ultimate success in life? How do you put a value of success on a life? It's by what happens in the end. We measure the success of a life by the end result. Look at what he writes in verse 4, 5, and 6. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, the final judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. When all is said and done, and we're worshiping the king and the creator of the universe and the new heavens and the new earth, those that chose the road of failure, they're, they're just not going to be there. Verse 6, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We measure the value of a life, the success of a life, by what happens in the end. And maybe some who appear to be prosperous, who appear to be successful, but in the end, they're like chaff that the wind blows away. But those who delight in the word of God, not only are they fruitful, not only are they durable, but they will continue to prosper all the way into eternity for all the ages that are come. That's success. And that's what happens to the person who delights and meditates on God's word day and night. It took me years to realize the power of this, right? Maybe if you grew up in church, it's flannel boards and Bible memory quizzes and all that stuff. But this thing is living and it's powerful and it's active. One of my favorite verses is in Isaiah. It's Isaiah 55, 10 through 13. Just a few books over. And I love these verses. Listen to this. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I send it out. God's word will accomplish God's purpose. What is that purpose? Well, the first one is joy. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. And then here's one of my favorite verses, verse 13. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree. And instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. And this will be for the Lord's renown from an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. Uh, what God is saying here is the purpose of his word is to lead to your joy. Um, that weird thorn, thorn bush analogy. If you have a thorn bush in your backyard and you water it, what happens? You get a bigger thorn bush, right? But this is not the case with the water, the rain that comes from God's word. When this word comes into our lives, uh, we change from a thorn bush into something personally and organically different. It's, it's automatic transformation. That's what God's word has the power to do. When the Bible is read, um, lusting people become pure, right? Fearful people become courageous. Thieves become givers. Angry people become peacemakers. That's what the word of God has the power to do in your life, to utterly and completely transform you from the inside out. So we've got 10 minutes. I could leave you with that, and you're excited. You want to read the word of God. You want to be fruitful and durable and go on a prospering into eternity, and I could stop there, and you just get out your Bibles, and when you get to Leviticus, you're going to stop. <laughs> All right? You'll be frustrated. So I want to get really, really practical really practical for, for 10 minutes, and ask this question, how do you read the Bible in such a way that is pleasing to God? A lot of people read the Bible for wrong reasons, right? A lot of people read the Bible to advance a political agenda. A lot of people read the Bible to judge others. They read the Bible to fill their heads full of facts. But how do you read the Bible in such a way that it transforms you? And so there's just two ways that I've found uh, really beneficial in my life. Um, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4 it's a small verse. It's really cool. Um, but it says that um, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Everything you need for life and godliness, he's given it to you. Through the knowledge of him who called you. And he goes on to say, and he's given that through these very great and precious promises. Uh, through which you're able to participate in the divine nature and then escape your evil desires. So uh, these promises of God are extremely important. So the first way that we read the Bible in order to transform is by believing his promises, okay? Read a promise, believe it. Everyone say, read a promise, 
believe it. And we are not good at this, okay? We are an unbelieving people. In fact, every single person that's ever lived can be characterized by unbelief. Adam and Eve, they didn't believe that God wanted what was best for them. They thought that God was holding out, so they tried to get that pleasure themselves. What happened? We can still feel the consequences today. Or Israel, when God said, go and, and conquer this city, and they didn't believe that God would fight for them, 40 years in the desert marching around. Or the Pharisees didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, even when he stood uh, face to face with them. And, and we are unbelieving people. We are characterized by unbelief. We don't believe that God is sovereign and in control. We don't believe he wants what's best for us. We don't believe that he's in the midst of our suffering. We don't believe that he can use that suffering for our good. So, so here's how we use the Bible, okay? Uh, life starts closing in on you. Okay, finances or job or marital or relationship stress is just getting to you. There seems to be no way out of your problems. And you're, you're anxious, you're fearful, and, and you're, um, you're, that's causing rifts in your marriage and with your kids. Well, then you take up your Bible. You take up your Bible and you read Psalm 1611. You, God, will make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Or you read Psalms 138.8. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Or uh, you read Philippians 4.19. God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And you read those promises and you trust them and you meditate on them and you rehearse them and you memorize them and you put your faith in them. And finally, then and only then can you take your fear and anxiety and set it aside and replace it with peace and rest, and contentment, and satisfaction, and being fruitful, and durable, and prospering. But not only can you use the Word of God to kind of help put away fear and anxiety, um, I found that this is the best weapon against sin <laughs> that God has given us. It is the premier weapon against temptation. You see, the way that temptation uh, gets its power is by uh, trying to make me believe that I'll be happier if I pursue it. Temptation says you're going to miss out if you don't do this sin. You're definitely going to be happier if you commit sin than if you pursue this path of purity. And so say you're being tempted to sin, to, be, to lust or to get angry or to lie. What do you do? Well, Paul says in Romans 8, now hang with me. Paul says in Romans 8, if you kill sin by the Spirit, you'll live. So Paul says pretty clearly, if you're going to fight temptation, you got to do it by the Spirit. You've got to kill sin in such a way that it's not you that kills sin, but it's the Spirit that kills sin. Well, then you read further, and uh, you get into the armor of God in Ephesians. And what is the armor? What's the only offensive weapon we have in the armor of God? The sword of the Spirit. So Paul says you've got to use the sword of the Spirit to fight against temptation. We learn later in that chapter, what is the sword of the Spirit? It is the Word of God. And so here's how it works, okay? You're tempted to become angry, and uh, sin kind of whispers in your ear, that person's an idiot. Okay, you need to tell them off. Just cuss them out. You owe it to yourself, okay? Just put them in your place. You will be a much happier person. That's what sin tries to get you to believe. But then by the Spirit, you remember the words in the Bible that say, everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Why? Because a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. Remember Jesus' words, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. And you take your sword of the Spirit and you fight against temptation. Or temptation starts to whisper in your ear, God will never love you. You've made too many mistakes. I know you're going to church and trying this Christian thing. It's useless. God hates you. God is so angry at you. But then you take out by the Spirit the sword and you remember, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We believe that Christ showed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. And you use the sword of the Spirit to fight against temptation, or, or you're tempted to lust and to act on lustful thoughts. And so sin's whispering in your ear, you owe this to yourself. Your wife will never find out. No one's going to know. There's not going to be any consequences to this. Just one little moment of pleasure. You can hide it fine. Nothing's going to happen. But then by the Spirit, you remember, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say, if you look lustfully at a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So there's the fearful part. But then you remember uh, that amazing book, Song of Solomon, <laughs> which is filled with the benefits of remaining faithful and intimate to your wife. And I can't quote that because there's kids here. That's a great book. You need to read it. 
And so we pick up the sword of the Spirit and we fight. And we fight. And only this has the ability to knock off the candy coating of sin and expose it for what it really is. Lies. False promises. It says in Galatians chapter 3, if I can find it. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3. Look how, how serious Paul is about this. 3.1. You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Verse 2, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Verse 5, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? And powerful things happen. As you meditate and read and believe, you transform. And you finally find success. And this only happens when you put yourself under the influence of God's word. I can't explain to you how true this is. I can't. I can't explain to you how real this is. And I get a lot of questions sometimes. Why do you even believe in the Bible? It's an old book. The copies aren't trustworthy. All that's been uh, firmly decided that, yes, it's trustworthy. Uh, all the apologetics have, have taken care of that. When people ask, why do I believe in the Word of God? It's because I've seen it transform my life and transform others. You know, and I wish I would have taken this seriously 10 years ago. I mean, I wish I would have clung to the word of God and, and chosen to be influenced by it in, in the early years of my marriage, in the early years as a father. And there's still some times where I just, in prayer times, just kind of get overwhelmed with kind of grief. Like, how far along the road could I have been if I would have taken this seriously years ago? Um, but then uh, as I'm reading this psalm and even as I, uh, I was listening to the worship band practice uh, before they came up here this weekend, and God is able came on, and I just I started crying because I'm, I'm a dork, and uh, I cry at Hallmark commercials, but I had to rush back to the balcony. I was just crying, yes, you're able. And I thought, it doesn't matter how far along the road I am. I am on the right road, and hundreds of you are the same way. And you just get overwhelmed with thanksgiving and gratefulness that not only did God take sinful me and place me on the right road, but he's given me 66 living and active books on the Bible. Everything I need for life and godliness. Everything I need to ensure that I fight the good fight and run the good race until it's finished. So, Here's our challenge to you during this series. Now, it wouldn't be a challenge if it's easy, okay? This is our challenge to you. Some of you are like, I got this. Some of you are going to hear this and just cringe. But our challenge to you is over the next 30 days, read through the entire book of Psalms. And now that takes about five Psalms a day, okay? So we want you to read five Psalms a day for the next 30 days. Um, and uh, when you get to like Psalms 119, take it easy, okay? Psalms 119 is the long, longest chapter in the Bible. So some are going to be really short, some are going to be really long. Um, we've actually, for those of you that are tech savvy, we've created a 30-day reading plan. Um, if you take out your smartphone and click on the app um, and open it up, there's a little uh, button there that says read. So click on read, and there's going to be an icon that says read the book of Psalms in a month. You click on that, it's going to shoot you over to eVersion Bible. You'll sign in with Facebook. And now you have a checklist for 30 days. It'll send you uh, push notifications and remind you to do this stuff. But that's, that's our challenge to you. Read through the book of Psalms in 30 days. Now, when you read, you're going to find that uh, at first it's going to be a duty, but then it's going to slowly turn into a delight. And now when you read, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Read it with a pencil in hand, okay? If you have a Bible, I really encourage you to use a paper Bible. Take a pen in hand, a pencil in hand, and write all over that thing, okay? Circle words that you like. Circle really important truths. If you don't understand something, question it. And then when you go to your small group, right, because everyone's in a small group now, when you go to your small group, you can discuss the truths that God's kind of revealing to you and kind of interact with the Word of God in a community of believers. So that's our challenge to you. Can you do it? All right. If you can't do five psalms a day, do one a day. Okay? Then work your way up to five a day. If you can't do one a day, then do one a week and work your way up to one a day, okay? But don't let your inability to read five a day stop you. Just get through the book of Psalms in 30 days. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your grace and your mercy that you are so wise. Um, 
You are so omnipotent. You know absolutely everything about us, and um, you have chosen to share that wisdom with us. And so, God, I pray for the next 30 days um, that we could really see transformation. I pray that um, the word of God would just take hold of Hope Community Church and that it would just light a fire in all of our hearts so that we could go and reach the triangle and change the world. And I pray that, I just thank you for the transformation that's going to (laughs) happen and for the way that that husbands are going to love their wives more and wives love their husbands, Uh, for the fruit of the Spirit to be uh, born in our lives for the way we're going to take criticism better because you're going to criticize us a lot in these psalms. Um, And just for the joy and delight we're going to find in your word. So God, we we just ask you and plead with you, rescue us from delight in the world. Rescue us from the path of failure and put us on the right path through your word. That's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.